our Father in heaven, giver of all life and author of all things good, we entrust our great nation into your care, for it was you, our good shepherd, whom our founders followed. You are the creator and grantor of our cherished rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, all are forged by your loving grace. Guide our leaders in the paths of righteousness and justice. May their service to our nation be honoring to you, and may their decisions reflect your will. Remind us that true happiness is found only in Christ. Protect our men and women who fight for our freedom. Bless your church to shine and drive out the darkness in our cities. And remind us that your kingdom is not a red state nor a blue state. Your kingdom is not of this earth. So we plead with you. Bring conviction to our hearts and revival to this land. Send your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and come dwell with your people. Today we honor our Creator, our Lord, our Father. Thank you for your grace and blessings. And may you continue to bless our great nation. We pray to you in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Yeah. 
God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The book of Jonah, chapter 1, verses 1 to 17, chapter 3, verses 1 to 10, and chapter 4, verses 1 to 11, the Common English Translation. Commissioning of a Reluctant Prophet The Lord's word came to Jonah, Amittai's son. Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their evil has come to my attention. So Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship headed for Tarshish. He paid the fare and went aboard to go with them to Tarshish, away from the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, so that there was a great storm on the sea. The ship looked like it might be broken to pieces. The sailors were terrified, and each one cried out to his God. They hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to make it lighter. Now Jonah had gone down into the holds of the vessel to lie down and was deep in sleep. The ship's officer came and said to him, How can you possibly be sleeping so deeply? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps the God will give some thought to us so that we won't perish. Meanwhile, the sailors said to each other, Come on. Let's cast lots so that we might learn who is to blame for this evil that's happening to us. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they said to him, Tell us, since you're the cause of this evil happening to us, what do you do and where are you from? What's your country and of what people are you? He said to them, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were terrified and said to him, What have you done? The men knew that Jonah was fleeing from the Lord because he had told them. They said to him, What will we do about you so that the sea will become calm around us? The sea was continuing to rage. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm around you. I know it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. The men rowed to reach dry land, but they couldn't manage it because the sea continued to rage against them. So they called on the Lord, saying, Please, Lord, don't let us perish on account of this man's life, and don't blame us for innocent blood. You are the Lord. Whatever you want, you can do. Then they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased its raging. The men worshipped the Lord with a profound reverence. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made solemn promises. No escape for the prophet. Meanwhile, the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Nineveh hears God's word. The Lord's word came to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and declare against it the proclamation that I am commanding you. And Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's word. Now Nineveh was indeed an enormous city, a three days walk across. Jonah started into the city, walking one day, and he cried out, Just forty days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and put on mourning cloths, from the greatest of them to the least significant. When the word of it reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, stripped himself of his robe, covered himself with mourning clothes, and sat in ashes. Then he announced in Nineveh by decree of the king and his officials, neither human nor animal, cattle nor flock, will taste anything, no grazing and no drinking water. Let humans and animals alike put on mourning clothes and let them call upon God forcefully. And let all persons stop their evil behavior and the violence that's under their control. He thought, who knows? God may see this and turn from his wrath so that we might not perish. God saw what they were doing, that they had ceased their evil behavior. So God stopped planning to destroy them, and he didn't do it. Jonah balks at God's mercy. But Jonah thought this was utterly wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Come on, Lord, wasn't this precisely my point when I was back in my own land? This is why I fled to Tarshish earlier. 
I know that you are a merciful and compassionate God, very patient, full of faithful love, and willing not to destroy. At this point, Lord, you may as well take my life from me, because it would be better for me to die than to live. The Lord responded, Is your anger a good thing? But Jonah went out from the city and sat down east of the city. There he made himself a hut and sat under it, in the shade, to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a shrub, and it grew up over Jonah, providing shade for his head and saving him from his misery. Jonah was very happy about the shrub, but God provided a worm the next day at dawn, and it attacked the shrub so that it died. Then as the sun rose, God provided a dry east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint. He begged that he might die, saying, It's better for me to die than to live. God said to Jonah, Is your anger about the shrub a good thing? Jonah said, Yes, my anger is good, even to the point of death. But the Lord said, You pitied the shrub, for which you didn't work and which you didn't raise. It grew in a night and perished in a night. Yet for my part, can't I pity Nineveh? that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who can't tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm done. This is getting absurd. They're raising our property taxes again. Why? Why? One look at our neighbor's house, and they'll see that value around here is going down real fast. I mean, do, do John and... And what's her face even know how to take care of her home? Maybe paint the exterior every once in a while, you know? They have a brand new lawnmower just sitting in the garage. I would love a lawnmower like that. But no, I have to have the kind that you have to hope and pray that it starts every time that you pull the cord. Everything around here is, is just breaking. I've asked the kids a dozen times to pick stuff up, but there's crumbs everywhere, there's soda cans, there's laundry on the floor, and it's not just in their rooms, okay? I saw a sock in the hallway. There is a, there's a t-shirt on the dining room table. I mean, are they even listening to us? Oh, and by the way, the fees for the ballet lessons, they're due. Let's have fun with that conversation, shall we? Sorry, sweet girl, your ballet dreams can't come true because mom and dad can't pay. This house that you wanted, it is breaking down by the minute and now it's too expensive for us to live in. Who hurt you? What? Who hurt you? A lot of people. And I guess it's messing with me. So today we're continuing our journey through the Old Testament, and we're going to take a little bit of a detour. We've been very consistently going through uh, the history of the Old Testament, and it's been going, progressing pretty well. But now we're taking a little bit of a side journey and looking at the story of one uh, particular person. Uh, and that person is a prophet by the name of Jonah, who many of you, or probably most of you, have heard the name and are somewhat familiar with his story. For those familiar with it, uh, people see this as a story about listening to God's call and following where God is calling in your life. And some people just know this is the story of the guy who was swallowed by a whale or a big fish. Um, but at its core, what I find is that it's a story about anger. And I remember there was this, uh, this line I heard from a TV show I, I liked when I was a kid. Uh, it, was a, it was a show called The Pretender. And most of you have probably not heard of it because it, didn't last very long. It was only on a couple of years, and uh, it's not on any of the streaming services now where you can watch old episodes. 
But there was a character named Miss Parker, who was a very angry, severe character. She worked for a, a corporation that um, basically what they did is they exploited gifted individuals to sell military weapons and weapons of mass destruction, that kind of thing. And she was a very angry person. You never saw her character smile. And there was one scene in the show where someone that she was talking to said to her condescendingly, oh, you're, you're so full of anger. And she just looks at the guy and says, that's my religion. And as we journey through Jonah's story, I think we're going to see that that, that statement that anger is my religion uh, relates to Jonah pretty well. So the story goes that the prophet Jonah was called by God to go to the city of Nineveh and warned them that God was going to destroy them in 40 days. So Jonah does what every good prophet does. He runs away and boards a ship for a city called Tarshish, which in the known world was about as far away from Nineveh as you could get. So while at sea, a storm comes that threatens to sink the ship. The sailors believe this was the work of an angry God, so they start asking each other if any of them had done anything to anger their God, because the men on the ship all worship different gods. Finally, they find Jonah, and instead of being on deck, up on the top deck trying to help keep the boat from sinking, he's very comfortable down below deck sleeping. So when they found him, they found out that he was on the run from his God. They prayed to that same God, the God of, the God of Israel. They pray for mercy. And finally, Jonah says to them, you know what? Just throw me overboard and the storm will stop. So they did, and just as Jonah predicted, the storm stopped. Now, while floating in the water, he was far from shore. So God sent a giant fish. Some people say a whale, but the translation reads giant fish. Uh, to swallow Jonah whole. And while in the belly of the fish, Jonah prays to God, begging for mercy for his misdeeds and offering to do what God asked him to do. This giant fish then vomits Jonah onto dry land, and Jonah makes the journey to Nineveh. God now comes to jo uh, had come to Jonah a second time, asking him to go to Nineveh and tell them about their pending doom. So Jonah goes to Nineveh, which is a very large city, a three-day walk from one end to the other. He walks for one day, stands up in the middle of the town, and says to the people, just 40 days more, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, these people didn't know Jonah, but for some reason, they believed him. There was something about what he said or how he said it. They took him seriously. They immediately start to repent, and when word gets to the king of Nineveh, he represents, or he repents as well, and he orders that all in the city must turn from their wicked deeds, and not only will the people wear mourning clothes and show their repentance, so will the animals and the livestock. But Jonah isn't happy. You'd think after preaching the most effective eight-word sermon in history, he would be thrilled, but he wasn't. This act of repentance by the Ninevites caused God to change his mind about punishing them, and this causes Jonah to get angry. And he goes off and he pouts. Jonah goes outside the city of Nineveh and sits on the hillside and tells God, you know what? Why don't you just let me die? Why don't you just kill me? God becomes concerned with how angry Jonah has become. And he decides to show him a little bit of mercy. So Jonah was sitting there pouting on the hillside, being with the heat and the sun bearing down on him. Remember, this is the Middle East, very hot out. And God made this large tree grow up instantaneously so that Jonah could be shaded beneath its branches. And, and this was very pleasing to Jonah. But then the next day, God sends a worm to kill the tree's roots, and it withers away, which now makes Jonah very angry. So now Jonah is angry, not just about the mercy that God showed the Ninevites, but he's mad at God for killing his tree. God asks Jonah if he thinks his anger is a good thing, to which he says, yes, my anger is good, even to the point of death. Jonah is so angry that God didn't punish the Ninevites that he decides he would rather just die than have to witness these evil people be let off the hook. God tries to reason with Jonah that his anger is not healthy, but we never hear how Jonah responds. 
And that's where the book ends. I mean, the book of Jonah is only four pages in the Bible. So the reader is left to wonder, what happened? Did Jonah come to understand where God was coming from? Did Jonah get his wish and just die? What happened to the Ninevites? Some of these questions we know the answers to, but others we don't. Looking at this story, one thing we don't think about is why it was written. All the books in the Bible are written in different stylings for different purposes. Some are the historical retelling of actual events. Others are fables that share valuable lessons for God's people, the intended audience. Others are poetry that share the author's faith and relationship with God. But Jonah is unique in that this book is very much a satire. I mean, think about it. You have this outrageous story where Jonah, a prophet that speaks directly to God, keeps finding himself in all these crazy situations. He gets swallowed by a giant fish. And he's living inside the fish, praying to God. You have cows and livestock that are wearing sackcloth as a way of repenting for the sins of Nineveh. You have Jonah being so angry that he goes off and he pouts. And the only thing that brings Jonah any joy is this tree that pops up out of nowhere, and then it's killed by a worm. Now, to the people that this book was intended for, this is meant to be a funny story, but a funny story that carries some important meaning and some important lessons. Most people like to focus on the part of the story where Jonah is in the fish, but that is actually a very small piece. The fish is only mentioned twice in the entire book. What this story is really about is how to deal with anger when things don't go our way. And we look at that issue through the lens of Jonah's relationship with God. Now, from the very beginning, Jonah is defiant toward God because he refuses to go to Nineveh in the first place. Now, Nineveh was not a great, you know, to use a Methodist term, not a great appointment. It was a terrible city. It was a city that was part of the Assyrian Empire, which is not a part of Israel. Nineveh is located in what is modern-day Iraq. The citizens of the city and the entire Assyrian Empire hated the Israelites. And history would tell us stories of all these brutal ways in which the Assyrians treated the Israelites, killing them and torturing them. Jonah knew all this. So Jonah saw nothing good coming out of him going to Nineveh, so he refused. So God had to use some extraordinary measures to get him to go there. And when God forgives the people of Nineveh after Jonah warns them of their impending doom, Jonah gets mad at God for forgiving them. So when Jonah went to Nineveh, what was he expecting? I mean, the Ninevites repenting and changing their ways should have been the goal. This should have been a cause for celebration for Jonah as he accomplished what he was sent to do. I think the issue lies in what Jonah was hoping to accomplish and what God was hoping to accomplish being two different things. Jonah was seeking vengeance. God was seeking redemption. Jonah is so angry at the Ninevites that even though they promised to change their ways for him, that is not good enough. In his eyes, they are irredeemable. There is nothing they can do to be worthy of God's mercy. He still wants to see them punished. So even though Jonah is a prophet of God, he is putting his anger and what he wants before what God wants. So you might say, for Jonah, anger has become his new religion. I think it's kind of ironic that, you know, again, I'm preaching from what's called the narrative lectionary. So I'm not pulling this passage out of thin air. I'm following a intentional plan of scriptures and sermons. And I think it's really ironic that this passage comes to us during election week here in the United States, where we have so many angry people. Um, but this isn't healthy. And it seems over time, our country just seems to be getting angrier and angrier to the point where it feels like nobody is happy. This culture of anger and hostility, I, I don't know about you, I'm just exhausted by it. I mean, it feels like every single thing in life is a fight nowadays. I mean, you go to Dunkin' Donuts and someone screws up your coffee and you got people screaming. Uh, you know, if you don't want to wear a mask in public and someone says something to you, you yell at them. Um, if someone, a friend of yours, is voting for a candidate you don't like, well, then you're not speaking to them and you say something nasty to them. 
it just feels like civility is dead. And I think what it is, is as a society, we've become way too comfortable with being angry. And we have all these external sources causing us to be angry. You know, 24-hour news, social media, where we're constantly being fed negativity, where instead of anger being an occasional emotion, it's become a way of life. It's supposed to be a reaction to extreme circumstances. It's supposed to be an emotion that surfaces as a response to injustice, as a reaction to feeling betrayed or hurt by somebody, not supposed to be a way of life. I mean, personally, I hate fighting. I, I didn't grow up in a household where there was a lot of screaming and yelling, and it's something that I don't like being around it. But as a pastor, it's something that I pretty much deal with on a daily basis. And I hate it because after a while, it starts to rub off on me, and I start to feel angry. And sometimes I'll feel angry, and I'm, to be honest, I'm not even sure why. It's just being around it so much begins to wear on you. Maybe this is why Jonah was so bitter. I mean, as a prophet, Jonah would have dealt with a lot of rough things with God's people being a servant of God. I mean, we've shared the story of other prophets along this journey through the Bible. Think of Samuel and the things he dealt with while serving God, being rejected by the people because they wanted a king and they didn't want him. Maybe Jonah was burnt out. Maybe he was depressed. I mean, just keep saying, just let me die. He was miserable. And I think he knew that going to Nineveh was probably in the long run not going to accomplish anything. Jonah knew that the Ninevites were bad people, and he felt they deserved what God was going to do to them. So when God forgave them, Jonah was angry because he felt like they were getting off the hook. And eventually they would just go back to their old ways, and his trip there would have been just a huge waste of time. Not only did Jonah want the Ninevites punished for their bad behavior up to that point, he wanted them to be punished for he knew that they were going to go back to little ways. He wanted them to be punished for what they were going to do. Jonah's goal was vengeance. But God's primary goal is never vengeance. It's redemption. Because redemption means there is opportunity for change, whereas vengeance is about condemnation at any cost. Jonah didn't want to let the Ninevites off the hook because he knew they would just turn back to their old ways. And you know what? Jonah was right. Because about 30 years after the time of Jonah, the Assyrian Empire, its capital in Nineveh, would conquer and destroy the northern kingdom of Israel. And they did so in brutal fashion, proving they never changed. But you think God didn't know that was possible, maybe even likely? But what God has showed us here is that God was always willing to give us the opportunity to disappoint him. God knew that there was a real possibility that Ninevites' attitude of repentance would not last. But God gave them a chance at redemption. This is God's nature. As we've journeyed through the Old Testament, how many stories have we talked about and heard about God giving second, third, fourth chances to the Israelites only to be continually disappointed? whether it was the Israelites worshiping a golden calf, whether it was them complaining about wanting to go back to slavery in Egypt during the Exodus, whether it was when they rejected Samuel and demanded a king, even when David, King David, started to focus on his self-glorification as opposed to glorifying God, even with today's story of Jonah running away from God's call. Through all of it, God offered redemption. But when God offers that same redemption to the Ninevites, Jonah is angry because he didn't feel they deserved it. There's a newsflash. None of us deserve it. But God offers it anyway. That same opportunity for redemption that was shown to the Ninevites is the same opportunity we are given every single day of our lives. But oftentimes it's an, op oftentimes it's an opportunity that we squander. We spend so much of our time judging and condemning each other for not meeting our own personal expectations. And all we do is make ourselves more and more angry over things we can't control. We villainize those that disagree with us to the point where we stop seeing them as people. People with different backgrounds, different upbringings that shape who they are today. We are all at different parts of our life journey. 
as people, we grow, we change, we evolve. I mean, the person you are today is most likely a lot different than the person you were 10 years ago, and is a lot different than the person you'll be 10 years from now. We learn. We look back at our lives and sometimes shake our heads at who we used to be and how we used to think. But the reason we change is because we are shown grace and given the opportunity for redemption. If we are attacked for who we are, we are more likely to dig in our heels and double down on our beliefs because we don't want to give those attacking us the satisfaction of thinking that they've won. But when we are constantly angry with each other, we are cutting off any opportunity for redemption. This can be done in the form of snotty comments, yelling at someone over something minor, passive aggressive remarks, or just direct insults. Whether you feel justified or not in these actions, they accomplish nothing except to further divide us. They don't change hearts. In fact, they harden hearts. I've never met anyone who has had a change of heart because they were insulted into it. But I do know of people whose hearts have been changed through grace. We all hurt each other, and we all hurt people who think differently than us, whether we mean to or not. We want, to see, we want people to see things from our point of view. We want everyone to think like us. But too, far too often, the tactics we use are not effective. In fact, the tactics divide us even further. So when you say things to people that think differently than you and the conversation is difficult, you need to ask yourself, what is your ultimate goal? Is it vengeance or is it redemption? Jonah's anger toward the Ninevites was justified. They had done terrible things to his people. But Jonah had no right to say that they could not be redeemed. God is the only one equipped to decide that. If they were willing to repent, they were just as deserving of God's grace as Jonah was, even though Jonah didn't see it that way. And in the end, what did Jonah's anger get him? He was alone on a hillside, stewing in his anger, which only hurt himself. His anger didn't change anything. The American theologian Frederick Buckner once said, of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savor to the last toothsome morsel both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. As I pointed out earlier, one of the interesting things about the story of Jonah is we don't really know how it ends. The last words we hear from Jonah are, my anger is good even to the point of death. He's not backing down. And the last words we hear from God are, can't I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who can't tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? God's pleading his case. And from what we can tell, they never come to an agreement. Did they come to a place where they could agree to disagree? We don't know. Or did Jonah's anger consume him? So maybe the story ends this way on purpose. Maybe it's so the reader can think about how they would respond. We know what God wants. God wants redemption. But are we willing to sacrifice the vengeance we seek to attain it? I mean, let's be honest. There is a lot in this world that should upset us. There's so much injustice and so much corruption, so much pain and suffering there are things that we should be angry about because anger calls us to action. But living in a constant state of anger and not even really knowing why, it's tearing us apart. And, and living like that really just, it sucks. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. It's tearing apart friendships, families, communities. It even tears apart churches. It's like we're reverting back to that childlike mentality that if I don't get my way, I'm just going to throw a tantrum. Jonah in this passage is throwing a tantrum. So maybe the only way for God to get his point across to Jonah was to let him sit in that anger and walk away. God didn't repay Jonah's anger with anger, and neither should we. 
The only way our society can heal is very simple. Stop the anger. It doesn't matter who our elected officials are. We have the choice on how we behave. Earlier today, I was listening to a, a podcast uh, called the Hungry Hearts Together Live podcast, and their guest was uh, Nadia Bowles Weber, who's a Lutheran pastor that I've quoted and talked about many times in my sermons. And it was a fascinating article about anger and compassion, not article, sorry, podcast about anger and compassion. So Nadia goes on to talk about how she grew up with a disease called Graves' disease, which led uh, to one of the physical signs of this disease was that her eyes bulged out of her head and so much so that her eyelids wouldn't even shut. And she found that because of the bullying that she dealt with as a kid, she isolated herself. She became very much a loner and she became very defiant towards those that bullied her to the point of being very angry. And as she grew older, she said that the combination of that anger she was feeling, that isolation, and also becoming a drug addict and alcoholic became a deadly combination for her and she became an addict. She said that she learned that the cause of anger is underlying sadness, shame, and fear. And she said that for her, it was easier to be angry than to admit to people that she was sad or hurt. But as she's grown older, she's found power, power in her vulnerability. She says she's softened in recent years as she's gone through a divorce and she's in a relationship now with a new person who, where she feels truly loved for the first time in her life. And she says that she's been dabbling with compassion, which is something she admits that she struggled with. And the main person that she's found compassion for is her younger self. So she learned that if you don't have compassion for yourself, you can't have compassion for others. And she goes on in this, in this interview to talk about how in society, we're not allowed to have compassion for those we disagree with. And because of that, we're forfeiting our humanity. But she said that the one question we need to ask ourselves, what is it in me that I'm struggling with when I'm so angry with another person? Now, she was asked, how do you deal with people that you see as being prejudiced? You know, talking about how we view each other in this political climate. And she was asked, do you hate people that are different than you or that you feel as being hateful? And she said, no. In fact, in fact I love them because they get to carry all my xenophobia for me. She says that when you have people that you feel are, you know, more hateful than you are, it gets us so you don't look at yourself. And her quote was, we love it when people are so obviously worse at things that we're a little bit bad at because we get to put it all on them. And then it builds a social cohesion when we collectively cast them out. So basically, we're all dealing with stuff. We all have things about ourselves we don't like. But when we see people who are worse at it than we are, we have this tendency to take our anger towards ourselves and put it onto these people and ignore what we don't like about ourselves and creates almost like this warlike mentality where it's us versus them. And the example she gave was she was asked to do an interview with Lance Armstrong. Now, most of you probably know Lance Armstrong. He was the cyclist who won the Tour de France seven times after battling cancer, and he, and he was a national hero. But then it came out that the entire time he was cheating by doing illegal drugs. And when he was discovered doing illegal drugs, he lied about it and he ruined other people's lives to try and cover up for his, his illegal behavior. So when Nadia Bowles Weber went to interview him, she said, um, first question she asked was, I heard you got in trouble for taking illegal drugs. And she said she knew a lot about that. So how many people have, you know, got an unfair advantage in life? But we see someone like Lance Armstrong, so we put all that anger on him as if he's the only person who ever cheated. And we make him the scapegoat. And we do it with so many people. Whenever we have a little bit of something we don't like about ourselves, we find someone who does it worse than us and put all that anger on them. Nadia Bowles Weber was a drug addict when she was growing up. She knows a lot about using illegal drugs and how that can hurt people. So she realized that she could not take that hurt and put it on someone else because people who were talking to her before this interview wanted her to take, take him to task, but she wasn't willing to do it. 
God wasn't telling Jonah to go hang out with the Ninevites and have coffee. He was telling Jonah that their redemption was between God and them, and that Jonah being angry about it was not going to change anything. In fact, the only person who's Jonah's, who Jonah's anger was going to hurt was Jonah. At some point, this culture of constantly being angry has to stop. The insults, the judgments, the, the constantly assuming the worst of other people, it just has to stop. We have enough things in our world that are out of our control that are making life difficult. We need to stop adding to that burden with the things we can control. I'm not saying we can't be angry at times. We need to be angry and speak out against injustice. We need to be God's hands and feet in the world, but we also need to realize that part of being God's hands and feet is first seeking redemption, not vengeance. We need to seek redemption, not because it's deserved, but because none of us deserve it. Yet God gives it to all of us anyway. Now let us pray. We listen to the stories like the call of Jonah and find them interesting, but unrealistic. When we look at our own lives, we believe that we cannot leave everything to follow a call into the unknown. We have many responsibilities and ties which keep us from following, but God is persistent. God understands our confusion and doubts, and God continues to call us to be in ministry and mission in this world. It may not mean leaving everything behind, but it does mean being willing to serve wherever God calls us. That can be hard. We want to place conditions on service, and usually those conditions are if we have time, if we have energy, if we can just try serving God for a little while to see how it all works out. Still God calls to each of us. Discipleship is difficult. Forgive us, patient and persistent Lord, for the very many times we turn our backs on serving you and focus on our own comforts. Forgive us when we look the other way when people are in need. Forgive us our angry attitudes and actions which hurt rather than heal. Wrap your arms around us, healing our wounds, binding us to you. Gently move us into service in your name. Amen.
Okay, maybe we need to go over this one more time. Do we have to? Well, sweetie, I don't know if you're getting a good grasp of the ratios here. Fine. Okay, all right, well, step by step. Before we spend any money, what's the first thing that we do? Give to God. Good, and why do we do that? Because he first loved and gave to us. Good, 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 good. Okay, great. Now the second jar here is for so many different things. Hold on. What? God lives in heaven, right? Yeah, he lives in heaven. And heaven has streets paved with gold, right? Streets paved with gold, sure, yes. So why does he need my money if I don't even have a job? <laughs> okay, all right, so good question. So basically when we give to God, we're, we're giving to the church. So the church gives the money to God? No, the church keeps the money. Oh, does God know about this? <laughs> yes, he uh, basically built the system, yeah. Okay, good. Okay. See, sweetie, as you grow up, there is nothing better than giving back to God. In the Bible, it's the only place God says, test me on this. When it comes to your money, he says, test me. It's almost like he's saying, I dare you. And your mom and I, we do just that. Even when things are tough... We always give the first part of our money back to God. And then the church takes that money and does all kinds of things to make God famous, uh, like camps and mission trips and even VBS that you love so much, and even helps out people that are in need. You can't outgive God. And when God says test him and you do it, he will come through every single time. Okay, Dad, I get it. I do have one question, though. Oh, okay. Why do we need to test God if he already knows all the answers? That's, that's good. Let me just retrace my steps here just for a minute. <sighs> Amen. Mm -hmm. 
Oh 
May the beauty of God be reflected in your eyes, the love of God be reflected in your hands, the wisdom of God be reflected in your words, and the knowledge of God flow from your heart that all might see and seeing believe. Amen.